We've talked a lot about issues pitting Republicans against Democrats in recent weeks, but my next guest argues the nation's biggest problem right now is less about partisanship and more about democracy itself, which he argues is in crisis. But he doesn't just point the finger at politicians. Harvard Law professor and former presidential candidate Lawrence Lessig says we need to take a closer look at our own roles in this mess as well. His latest book lays out where we've gone wrong and his multi-part prescription, Right the Ship. It's called They Don't Represent Us Reclaiming Our Democracy. Lawrence Lessig joins me now, Larry. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Okay, so democracy's broken. The disease is a word I've never heard before. Mm-hmm. Unrepresentativeness? Yeah, is that right. the word? Okay, yeah, fine. It's a big word. So what are the symptoms? All the dimensions of our democracy where we don't get represented equally. So the most obvious ones are gerrymandering. Mm-hmm. Um, The Electoral College, which basically gives the swing states the power to pick our president, the way we fund campaigns, the way votes get suppressed, the United States Senate. These are all dimensions of a democracy, which means that we are not, as citizens, equal with anybody else. So let's go down the list for a second. We all know that it was a 5-4 decision in the Supreme Court on uh, even extreme partisan gerrymandering, saying we don't get involved in this kind of stuff. It's politics, even though that's BS. I think they get involved a lot of political things. When we watch a hearing like today where the partisanship is painful and it's so clear democracy is broken, whether you're pro-impeachment or anti-impeachment, would getting rid of gerrymandering help alleviate that partisan problem? I think absolutely. How so? And the reason is, you know, gerrymandering draws districts where congressmen are safe as a congressman, meaning the seat is certain for a Democrat or certain for a Republican. But the person in that seat is still afraid of being beaten by somebody, but they're afraid of being beaten by somebody in their own party. But the kind of person who can beat them in their own party is a more extreme version of them. So if you're a liberal Democrat in a safe seat Democratic district, you're worried about an even more liberal Democrat. Or if you're a Republican in a safe seat Republican district, you're worried about an even more conservative Republican, which means they're constantly focused on the extremes, and that means the extremes get amplified inside of this. But if the Supreme Court won't listen, how do you get to the fix, even if everybody agrees you're right? Well, Congress has the power under Article 1, Section 4 of our Constitution to eliminate partisan gerrymandering tomorrow. They could pass a statute, and there are many statutes Mm -hmm. in Congress to do this, to ban states from partisan gerrymandering, and that's what I think they should do. Okay, Electoral College, you're not part, uh, you're not uh, prescribing this national popular vote deal where states like Massachusetts have said, we, assuming we ever hit states yeah. that uh, with 270 electoral votes who've signed on to this, I think it's 190 something now, we will cast all our electoral votes for whoever wins the popular vote. That's not what you're pitching. That's right. What are you pitching? What I'm saying is right now we've got a system where the only states that matter are swing states. So 14 states in 2016 got 99% of campaign spending in the presidential election. Because why would you waste your time in a state like New York or Massachusetts or Texas? Because we know the results in those states. But the problem is the swing states states don't represent America. They're older, they're whiter, their industry is kind of late 19th century industry. There are seven and a half times the number of people in America working in uh, solar energy as mine coal. But you don't hear about solar energy because those people come from Texas or uh, they so come how from do you California. Fix it? So the solution is to proportionally allocate electors. And in my book, I say down to the fractional level in every state. So that if you proportionally allocate it in every state, every state would matter. It wouldn't matter if you got a vote in Utah or a vote in Massachusetts. It would still contribute to you getting 270, which means the president would care about America as opposed to caring about this country called swing state America. And that could be done statutorily as opposed to by amending the Constitution? Well, I think it can be, although, you know, there's an that's argument about that. That's not a very definitive that. statement. It sounds well, like Well, that's right, sure. because I'm trying to be honest with yeah. you about, you know, this is an uncertain area. Mm-hmm. But I think that certainly if the Supreme Court, you know, we have this case with David Boies where he's challenging the allocation mm-hmm. of electors. If that can case gave a legal foundation for this being unequal, which is what David Boyes is arguing in these cases, then yes, we could absolutely, under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, say, okay, you have to allocate it to make it equal. Let's talk about campaign finance for a moment. Um, Here's uh, a painful image of a little boy uh, begging for money for his mother, who was then a candidate for the presidency. That would be New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Here's the kid. My mom doesn't have 130,000 people yet, so that's where you come in. Everyone who gives an amount even $1 or $5 gets us closer to 130000 And so you can see my mom on the debate stage, 
and she can tell you how she's going to be the best president ever. Let me tell you, the Department of Children and Families should go after his mother <laughs> for allowing her kid to do it. How do you fix can't You're a public finance kind of guy, right? Yeah, and she had a great plan for fixing it. What she would have done is to give everybody $200 every single federal election in what she called democracy dollars that they could then give to candidates running for campaign. So in an election where you've got a representative, a senator, and a president, you get $600, which would radically change the way people raise money for their campaigns. Right now, members of Congress spend 30 to 70 percent of their time raising money from a tiny fraction of the 1 percent. But if you gave democracy dollars to people like Seattle has done and was able to withstand Amazon's onslaught in the last election, then people would begin to raise money from ordinary people, which means they would be dependent on ordinary people, which is the way democracy is supposed to work. Okay, you didn't when I asked you for your list of symptoms, you didn't list the following. It's my number one. It's in your book, by the way. Political advertising, in my opinion, the root of all undemocratic evil. Most polls, uh, people say the most they know about a candidate is from political advertising, yeah. and it's negative advertising that's yeah. the most powerful. Right. There is something called the First Amendment. So what, what does one do? There? Yeah, well, you're not going to ban political advertising. The First Amendment will stop any law from banning that kind of advertising. We've got to draw people's attention away from that kind of speech. And that's the hardest part of the book. Like the first part, which is how do you fix government, I, mm. I think is relatively easy. Whether it's politically possible or not is a different question. The second part, how you begin to make it so we actually can be represented and understand the issues to be represented is the harder part. And part of the reason is the psychology of things like um, negative ads, which of course have an effect whether you like it or not. You hear it in the back of your head and you're going to respond to it, which is why that's what they spend most of the money But you make a point on. that the First Amendment is not absolute here. I didn't even thought about this. I'm embarrassed to say. You say you can't campaign more than X number of feet from a polling place. We've all experienced that. Yeah. So how far could we go well, and not violate the Constitution on political advertising? Do you I think? think we've got to give the court a reason to, uh, to, to understand that you know, negative advertising or social media advertising is a lot like how close we can get to a polling place. Right now they would say they're totally different and they would have no hesitation in striking down any regulation like that. But that's why I think it's so important that companies like Twitter are experimenting was saying, we're not going to sell political ads during this election season. But it's a lot easier for them than face Facebook. Of course it is. is a much more important venue yeah, for of course, political advertising. But I think, you know, other countries that don't have a First Amendment, if they begin to experiment and we could begin to see the consequence, like, do people behave less crazy in a world where they're not being manipulated by these ads? Then you begin to have the factual foundation that maybe would lead the court to be more open to understanding how we build an environment. That can we end where we began on this pogo notion that, you know, we have seen the enemy and it is us. There was a poll that I saw uh, yesterday. It was an NPR poll, actually. Can you imagine anything changing your mind about impeachment? It's November 11 yeah. to 15. Sixty five percent of the people already say no. Two days of testimony, and already people are two thirds of America locked into their position. How do you solve the problem with us, in my estimation, that we are? Well, how do you solve that problem? Well, the biggest problem we've got now, compared to the uh, you know the impeachment of Nixon, is that when we impeach Nixon, everybody was watching the same story, mm -hmm. same three networks. They were right down the middle. And there's this almost perfect correlation between Republicans and Democrats in their attitude about Nixon. And when Nixon started losing support, he lost support mm, with everybody. If you look at the polls right now with Trump, there is no connection between the Democrats and Republicans because we live in our separate universes. You're watching Fox or you're watching MSNBC. So how do you get them back in the same universe? Well, that's not something we're going to fix either in an easy or simple way. And this is, I think, the biggest challenge that we've got to begin to, at least in a context like an impeachment, get these networks to understand they need to serve a higher purpose than just what's going to sell the most ads on their network to begin to knit together a nation that understands the facts in a similar way. We can disagree about what to do, but at least understand the same set of facts so that we don't have almost a civil war-like reality where one group thinks one thing and the other group doesn't understand how they can think what they think. Okay, sign me up. That's two of us, Lawrence okay. Lessing. Thanks, Thanks so much. Jeff. Your book is terrific. The book, again, is They Don't Represent Us Reclaiming our democracy.